Hey guys, Kenny here. Today we're going to be talking about meat, more particularly both animals and seafood. We'll look at from feed to factory and wild versus farm and the impact of meat in terms of our environment. Now, before we get started, I have a question for you. What is the single greatest human cause of climate change on the planet? Is it carbon belching buses and transportation, power plants and energy production, or animals as food production? Well, if you guessed animals for food production, you're right. Are you surprised? Animal food production has now surpassed both the transportation industry and electricity generation as the single greatest source of greenhouse gases. So keep that in mind as you go ahead and go through and try and tie this back into sustainability and agroecology that we talked about earlier on. So let's look at our essential questions. Number one, what are the impacts of IFAP, which is industrial food animal production on human health and the environment? Number two, what can be done to raise animals in a more sustainable and humane way? Number three, how does seafood production affect ecosystems? And number four, what would make seafood production more sustainable? So let's start by looking at land animals and we'll finish off kind of looking at seafood before we go ahead and tie everything together. Now, meat consumption has grown steadily. Global meat consumption is likely to double by the year 2050. About half the world's meat from livestock raised on unfenced rangeland pastures. The other half is being raised in what we call industrialized, industrialized factory farming. So large numbers of animals are bred in feedlots, cages, pens, in, to gain weight as quickly as possible in what we call CAFOs, C-A-F-O-S, CAFOs, or concentrated animal feeding operations. So that's the industrialized farming half. And it's these CAFOs in particular that are greatly threatening, threatening the environment and human health. So let's look at how that consumption has grown over the course of the last, say, 50 years. If we go ahead and take at the production of eggs, seafood, meat, milk, and total of all of them combined, you can see that when we start looking at the United States, and this is for 2009, we consume more meat, right, per person in a year than anywhere else in the world, okay? And not just by a li little bit. You look at that total number there, uh, for all milk, meat, seafood, and eggs. And the world average is just over 150 kilograms per person per year. In the United States, however, the number is over 400 kilograms per person per year. So we, as a nation, are a great offender when it comes to consumption of animal products. Now, this comes in a lot of different forms. And is it chicken? Is it pork? Is it beef? we consume a lot of different types of meat. Well, maybe not a lot, but we, it's not just one thing. So let's look at each one of these and talk a little bit about the impact of that. For me, I still like to do chicken. Um, I don't eat beef or pork uh, for a variety of reasons. One of them is I have cl high cholesterol. We've also talked about the environmental input uh, impact and my older son has decided to become a vegetarian. Now, in these kind of CAFOs or these feeding operations, chickens are packed tightly and rarely to never go outside. Most poultry products come from these type of feedlots, feedlots and unless they are free range, um, which it has to be certified and say on the package, but no matter the size of the CAFO, it will likely need a permit and regular audits to monitor potential pollutants added to surface waters and a nutrition management plan to make sure that not only is the groundwater clean, but there aren't any other pollutants coming along with it and it's not getting back into the food supply. Now, this idea of a nutrient management plan is an important one because it applies as well to uh, pigs and to cows as well. So what is a nutrient management plan? Well, a nutrient management plan is a plan set up by a CAFO uh, or similar operation 
that includes adequate manure storage because all that waste has to go somewhere. Um, that we go ahead and properly handle dead animals and chemicals so that that isn't ending the food system or somehow ending up into the water supply and diverting clean water away from production areas to make sure that there's less chance if something goes wrong that you're going to end up contaminating the water supply. In order for this to take place, you have to have pretty routine testing to ensure that the animals are kept out of the surface water and that the soils and manure are clean and don't have any uh, weird viruses or bacteria. This is where a lot of things, when we start thinking about like the swine flu or the avian flu, these tight quarter living conditions are what typically lead to it being spread to humans. Okay. So something to kind of keep in mind. So chickens, CAFOs, tightly packed, rarely go outside. Very similar to that is what we're going to go ahead and see with pigs. So if you look at hog raising, again, like chickens, CAFOs for hogs aren't really that different. The pigs don't usually go outside, if at all, and most pork products are produced this way unless it's specifically identified. Permitting and nutrient management plans are very similar to what you would see for chickens. Okay. Again, there's a whole bunch of waste. Where does that go? How is it collected? How is it processed? These are all things that are going to impact the environment. Um, and before we move on, I kind of want to go back to chickens again, but instead of doing it in terms of raising chickens for meat, maybe you don't eat chicken, but you consume eggs. Well, the laying operations can also uh, be in these types of environments. Because egg production also falls under the CAFO designation, but not all chickens uh, that lay are cared for in the same manner. There are regulatory definitions here that must be met in order to be labeled cage free, free range, organic, or enriched colony. Um, to give you a local example of an egg laying business, let's learn a little bit about Willamette Egg Farm. Hi, I'm Greg Satrum, and this is my dad, Gordon. We're second and third generation egg farmers here at Willamette Egg Farms in Oregon. And we are happy to welcome you to our family farm. Members of my family have been raising chickens in the Willamette Valley since 1852. The business officially began in 1934 when my great uncle Tom started delivering eggs to restaurants, grocery stores, and hotels in the Portland area. He started with 400 hens and was soon filling orders with his eggs and eggs from neighboring farms. Over the years, the flock grew and facilities were added. In 1985, we acquired an existing farm in Eagle Point, Oregon. And then in 2006, we purchased another farm in Washington State. Today, we care for about 2 million hens that produce more than 1.6 million eggs every day. We remain the only local family owned and operated egg farm in Oregon. We take great care to ensure our hens are healthy, so every egg we produce is high quality egg. And we never use hormones or antibiotics. We also oversee every aspect of the egg production process on our farm. From producing our feed to operating the trucks that deliver our eggs across the region to guarantee you safe, fresh eggs. At Willamette Egg Farms, we believe in consumer choice and are committed to giving our customers what they want, which is why we produce both conventional and cage-free eggs, along with a variety of egg products. We celebrated our family farm's 75th anniversary in 2009, and now we're looking forward to the next 75 years of providing you and your family with our safe, affordable, and nutritious eggs. Amazing how different uh, those feeding organizations can look in different lighting, right? Um, so when you start thinking about this, I mean, we've talked about the benefits of eating local in terms of those food miles, well, whether you like that TEDx that kind of debunked it or not. I mean, it's still beneficial in a lot of respects, but um, when we start looking at using these local farms, there is a trend to move towards bigger farms with more chickens rather than smaller farms. So the, the days of the small farmer are kind of done in many, many respects with both animals and with plants. So 
as we go ahead and look on it, the biggest offender is obviously next, and that's going to be beef. Um, today, it is not uncommon for a single feedlot to hold 100,000 animals at a time. And while corn is the king of cattle feed, many industrial food animals are fed just about anything that they can to add weight cheaply and quickly. And this means that CAFOs like this produce huge amounts of animal sewage, as well as other pollutants. And unlike human sewage, the sewage for most CAFOs is not treated and contains disease-causing pathogens and chemical pollutants. In addition, there are over 168 gases emitted from CAFOs, including methane from the cattle, cattle belches and flatulence that are big impact on climate change. Now, it may be kind of hard to see how all this affects, and this is a great example of when we start talking about full cost pricing, the amount that you pay for the beef that you eat, for the chicken you consume, for the pork that you consume, does not reflect these environmental impacts or the potential health impacts. Um, if you take a look at beef, pork, chicken, milk, eggs, we are actually paying less than people were paying back in 1950. So in, in the last 50 years, the price for all of these materials has actually gone down. But what that doesn't reflect is our subsidies and these full cost pricing. It's estimated that each year American taxpayers subsidize the animal food system with about $38 billion, according to the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service. Okay, so what does that mean? According to David Robinson Simon in his book, Meatonomics, for every $1 of product that you pay for, the animal as food system imposes about $2 in hidden costs onto your taxpayers. So for every dollar you spend on a hamburger, you're paying about $2 in taxes to go ahead and subsidize or pay for those lower prices in your animal foods. And so you're actually paying more for the meat than you actually think you are. Just instead of paying for it at the store, you're paying for it in your taxes. Okay. Now, this is where subsidies get a little tricky and that helps with jobs and job sectors and stuff like that. But that's the end, end product cost for you, which is interesting to kind of keep in mind. And as we were looking at we, you know, the Willamette eggs earlier, that's a good example of what we saw call consolidation. So in agriculture, consolidation is the shift towards fewer and larger farms. The number of U.S. hog farms, for example, declined from 1.85 million hog farms okay, to 63,000 from 1959 to 2012. So a huge reduction in the number of farms but during that same time period, the average number of hogs per farm increased from 37 hogs to over 1,000 hogs, 1,044. So this kind of trend is the movement away from the small local farmer in favor of the CAFO. Okay. And again, don't forget that those CAFOs with all those animals comes a lot of higher risk in terms of potential waste products that we have to deal with like this hog waste that you're seeing in what's known as a manure lagoon. Because of consolidation, this is going to lead to much bigger problems with waste, etc. The hog waste from this 900 head facility, okay, so 900 pigs, is flushed out into a liquid cesspit, okay, that they euphemistically call the manure lagoon, right? All of the poop and waste is just kind of flushed here into a big puddle, okay, and then not really treated like human waste typically is, but allowed to sit there, evaporate off. But what if there's a rainstorm and you end up with some flooding? Where does it go? Well, it goes into the water supply. So we have to start thinking about things in terms of how can we be more ecologically friendly in terms of our production of these types of things, uh, cows, pigs, chickens, so on and so forth. And I think the best thing that we can start thinking towards is thinking about agroecology. Okay? 
what we talked about in the very beginning of this unit. Now, there's a great film out there called The Biggest Little Farm, and I think it does a good job kind of looking at how a farm can move towards sustainability with these agroecology processes. Um, so ecological production is going to look a little bit more like this. And to get to this point, we're going to need more restorative agricultural practices that are in line with our agroecology concept we started with. But at the same time, you have to be realistic in thinking about what Peter Newton from our discussed in our TEDx that we watched, the extra space for our food may be one of the biggest factors for deforestation around the world. Uh, the, note his example from the Amazon rainforest. Okay. One of the biggest reasons that you're seeing clearing of the Amazon rainforest is to put in farms. And a lot of that is actually to go ahead and not only grant, plant crops, but also to go ahead and raise livestock. And a lot of the crops that we actually produce are actually only raised to go ahead and feed livestock. We can mirror similar situations, similar conditions if we start thinking about pigs, okay? And even with beef, but we have to kind of balance the impact in terms of space and the time it takes for their raising in these kinds of environments and what that does in terms of greenhouse gases. So there's a lot of factors. It's not a, a simple one way or the other and that's go, but meat sustainability can be produced in a way that is better for the environment. It's the single largest factor in growing ecological footprints, especially of wealthier nations. And more sustainable methods are gonna include things like free range chickens to an extent, uh, use chicken manure for fertilizer, um, more grain efficient forms of animal protein, poultry, plant eating, farmed fish, these types of things. And we need to eliminate or sharply reduce our consumption of meat. At the, at the very end of the day, moving towards a more plant-based diet is one of the decisions that you can make every day that has the biggest impact on climate change. Let's look at some numbers here. Um, when you take a look at this, the efficiency of converting grain into animal protein is better if you're doing fish or chicken, but you can see that when you start looking at pigs and beef cattle, it, it's, not, it's not a fair trade. The amount of grain required for every pound or kilogram, depending on how you want to measure it, of beef or pork is high. So if you eat meat, what changes could you make in your meat eating habits to reduce your environmental impact? From this graph, hopefully you're recognizing that if you're gonna eat meat, it's more environmentally friendly to eat chicken or fish. Uh, beef in particular is, you know, over three times worse for the environment. Meat and dairy products are great sources of protein. Um, and in the past 60 years, meat production is up fivefold. That means it's five times higher than it used to be. And half of the meat from grazing livestock and the other half is from feedlot. Now, when we start looking at this, at least partly as a result of industrialization and of government policies that are supportive of IFAP, IFAP, the Industrial Food Animal Production, the US today produces far more animal products compared to early in the 1900s. And consumers generally pay less for them. But remember, that's not a full cost pricing, doesn't include the health impacts, environmental impacts, or even the actual cost because of subsidy. Industrial production uh, incurs heavy costs to our health and our ecosystems, and these costs are not reflected in the food prices. More and more, we're moving to large corporate feedlots and the amount of food and food per capita is on the rise. So at this point, I'd like you to go ahead and pause the video, go ahead and pop out and watch that uh, Ed puzzle on Out to Pasture, which is gonna explore the ecological approaches to livestock production through the eyes of rural communities and pasture-based farmers. So pause the video here, go ahead and go watch that and then go ahead and come back. Welcome back, what'd you think? So is it ecological approach, more sustainable? 
when we start thinking about agroecology, does it sound feasible enough, like something we might be able to do? I hope so. So now I'd like to kind of switch gears. We've been talking mostly about our uh, land, animals, livestock, and I want to switch to fish and shellfish. And in the same time period that we've been consuming increasing amounts of beef, pork, and chicken, fish and shellfish production has risen as well. And in the United States, we're actually less uh, in most cases of a consumer of this than in many other places in the world. Americans weekly consumption of seafood has stayed about five ounces per week for the past 30 years. But where does that fish come from? That may be a better picture. So is it a concentration of aquatic species suitable for commercial harvesting in an ocean or inland body of water? Let's go to a fishery. Okay. You're starting to see a rise, however, of something other than just our fisheries, and we're looking at what's known as an aquaculture. In aquaculture, we're raising fish and shellfish for human consumption. This is what's known as fish farming, and this is the fastest growing type of food production in the world. Most species are raised on algae or other plants, but we do also raise meat-eating species like shrimp and salmon. So, when we're harvesting fish that is not grown in one of these fish farms, where is it caught? How is it captured for human consumption? Well, according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, the world's authority on fisheries, about 34.2% of fisheries are overfished. The number of overfished fisheries has been slowly creeping up since the 80s. Um, but the proportion of overfished fisheries is not always a good indicator of seafood sustainability. We're finding that underdeveloped parts of Asia and Africa do not have good data on their fisheries and probably have pretty significant amounts of overfishing and likely have depleted stocks, making them look further out to get into more international waters to harvest more and more fish. The other factor is the industrialized fishing techniques. Rather than having a small fisherman like you see here going out with his individual net or somebody using fishing pole to go ahead and catch their fish, seafood production today in terms of big catch is something like this. And you're looking at about 400 tons of mackerel caught in what's known as a purse seam, which is a type of net outside of Chile. And most global seafood harvests use these gigantic nets that are pulled through the water or along the sea floor to capture their food. Now, when you use a huge net like this, you hope that the fish that you're catching are the fish that you're looking for to harvest, but um, you have to separate them from what's known as bycatch. And so in this particular example, what you're looking at here is this individual is separating the shrimp out from anything else that they caught. They were fishing for shrimp. Uh, but in shrimp harvesting in particular, only about 5% of what the trawlers catch is actually shrimp. The other 95% is what's known as bycatch. And some of that bycatch gets tossed back into the water, but some of it dies on the boat. And so we're killing these fish without any intention of ever eating them. But there is also a growing amount of farms for fish and seafood. Um, for example, uh, in Vietnam, here you're seeing in Vietnam, shrimp farms are on the rise. And in 2011, the U.S. imported 91% of its seafood, so we didn't actually do most of the catching ourselves. We had it harvested somewhere else and then shipped to us. So then we really can't think of this as a local only problem. We have to think of this as a much more global problem. And you start seeing data like this. These are global trends in the state of the world's marine fish stocks from 1974 to 2017. And the big trends that I hope that you'll take a look at are the increase in the unsustainable fishing practices uh, the sustainable amount has stayed about the same, but the decline in the areas that are underfished. Well, what happens when you get to a point where there are no underfished areas anymore? And that sustainable has hit the bottom, 
and the unsustainable continues to grow. So these are the problems that we're going to go ahead and have to face as we go ahead and continue to move forward. And this isn't just for fish, like you're thinking of, I'm going to have some tilapia, some trout, some salmon. This is also for seafood in terms of shellfish, when we start thinking about oysters, clams, etc. On this Australian farm, oysters are raised in submerged bags attached to poles. Okay, and so we're doing this for all si sorts of types of um, seafood. Now, when we start looking at these ecosystems where you have a whole bunch of uh, species, uh, individuals, I guess I should say, all close in one way. So what we start having to think about is, is how do they, how do these fished, farmed fish get their food? Uh, how do the wild fish get their food and what risks are there in terms of our food system? So we get to this concept known as biomagnification. Um, toxic chemicals and heavy metals flow into the ocean when industrial, agricultural, and human wastes run off or is deliberately discharged into rivers that empty into the sea. These pollutants then cause disease, genetic mutations, birth defects, reproductive difficulties, behavioral changes, and death in many of our marine organisms. But the severity of damage varies greatly depending on the species. And in many cases, animals near the top of the food chain are those most affected because of a process known as biomagnification. What this means is that the higher level predators, fish, birds, and marine animals, build up greater and more dangerous levels of these toxic materials than animals that are lower in the food chain. Now, so let's take a look at the process of biomagnification using a diagram. So if you take a look here, um, you could see runoff from either a mine or mercury or methyl mercury or something getting into the water system. And it's consumed by all these tiny little animals like krill, these types of things. But as you move up higher and higher in the food chain, you start realizing that those animals ate animals that ate animals. And you don't just eat once in your lifetime, but you eat daily. And so you, if you're eating these infected or um, you know, contaminated lower level species, you're eating a lot of them, which means the amount of these toxins are pooling or growing as you get to higher and higher levels of the food chain. Okay? So it's probably pretty safe to eat these you know, plant eating organisms because they're getting it from their environment, but they're not storing a whole bunch of it in their tissue. However, the farther up you go the food chain, you start thinking about things like trout, tuna, those are eating more of these smaller animals that have this toxin in them. So they're accumulating more toxin over the course of their life, making them more contaminated. And if you go even higher to these like third or fourth level consumers, they're eating even more. So you think about albacore, halibut, pike, sharks, the mercury levels or other contaminants that are, are getting consumed are at a high, higher level, much higher level. And so the recommendation, if you listen to the EPA, is to not feel too bad about eating these low level things that are pretty much plant eaters. So salmon's pretty safe, pollock, oysters, um, but you want to eat only a, you know, a few times a week things like trout or tuna. And then only a few times per month, those things like albacore, halibut, pike. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to kind of point out with this, with biomagnification, is that you're a pretty high level consumer. And if you're eating halibut, albacore, tuna, you know, pike, um, you are actually getting any concentrated mercury or any other contaminant from that food source. To give you an example, when I lived in the Caribbean, okay, one of my friends, he liked to go spear fishing. Um, he bought a little spear gun, and so he'd go off the coast of the island of St. Kitts that we lived on, and he would go ahead and catch lobsters, cook them up, and eat them. Now, what happened is there was an old abandoned mercury mine underwater between the two islands of St. Kitts and St. Nevis, and that was by one of the really good uh, lobster grounds. Well, the seal that they had put on it when they stopped mining there 
at some point cracked on the island. I don't remember the exact year. And they told us, um, don't fish on that side at all. Make sure you don't capture any fish or any seafood from that side of the island because they were worried about exactly this problem of biomagnification. Well, this buddy of mine, he decided he was still going to go over there because it was so much easier to get lobsters there than anywhere else on the island, and he liked them. So he went over, he started continuing, well, he continued to harvest the lobsters from these areas where he was told not to go, but liked to go ahead and fit, fish for them. And he ended up having to get life flighted off the island because he ended up with mercury toxicity, okay? Because he was getting it most likely from eating those lobsters that were in the area that was contaminated from the leak from the mercury mine. Okay, so you are a top level, level consumer and you are at risk of having to deal with biomagnification as well. But just as we talked about, there are more sustainable ways to go ahead and consume meat. Okay, when we start looking at beef, pork, chicken, um, there are more sustainable ways to go ahead and produce and harvest fish and shellfish. First of all, we need to get good certification systems in place. Um, there's the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, the Marine Stewardship Council, and they already have certifications, even though most of us don't know too much about them. We can start looking at open ocean aquacultures where the fish are limited, they're usually netted in, but they're essentially in the same wild environment um, as those that would be caught in the open ocean. If we're going to be looking at, um, you know, fish that migrate upstream or something like this, I think about salmon, for example, looking at zero discharge freshwater ponds and tanks. Um, this will help protect our coastlines from pollution while giving us, you know, access to some of these farmed fish. Uh, we just need to make sure that we have better consumer choices and are in more favor of what we call poly aquaculture. So again, not the monoculture we talked about with plants, but looking at multiple species because these complicated reef communities and things like this actually benefit from a diversity of different species. Um, fish and shellfish production really has increased dramatically. Uh, aquaculture is up 46% in 2016, 2006. Um, we're seeing ponds, underwater cages, and it turns out that at this current time, China produces about 70% of the world's farmed fish. So if you have farmed fish, it most likely came from China. Okay. And I think with respect to fish, it's not so much just about where it came from or whether it was done in an aquaculture, raised in a fishery or caught wild, but how much are we consuming? You know, I, biomagnification is obviously something we need to be concerned about, especially with higher level fish and depending on how much of it we're actually consuming. But what we start realizing is that, and I like this bottom table the most, is that the world fish catch per person has increased and continues to increase this per capita. So I know that I'm not necessarily eating more fish than I used to eat. And you know, when we start thinking about this, yeah, the population, world population is growing, but not only are we increasing the total number of fish caught, but the total number of fish caught per person is on the rise, which suggests that we're consuming a lot more fish, even though I, most people you talk to would not say they're consuming more fish than they used to. Most families aren't, wouldn't say they're consuming more fish than they used to. And I think the data suggests that we as a whole are not consuming more fish than we used to, but we have to be careful how much is being harvested, what's the impact in terms of bycatch. Um, the number of fish being caught is definitely higher. So do you eat fish? Maybe you enjoy some sushi or poke or shrimp or grilled salmon. Do you ask where your fish came from? when you buy it at the grocery store, fish market, or a restaurant. We have talked here about two primary methods, farming or catching them in the wild. But which one is better for you and for the planet? 
There are about 300 species of fish sold in the United States, but most Americans only eat three types of fish. Salmon's a big one, right? And so we've got to start thinking about, well, okay, how are we getting our fish? And is it better to have the wild caught or is it better to go ahead and have farm raised? It, which one of those is better for the environment? Well, regardless of which direction you go, I think we've seen that there are some pretty obvious answers that we need to go ahead and keep in mind when it comes to our meat intake, whether it's fish, or cow, or pig, or chicken. We can have a bigger impact on our environment if we shift to eating herbivorous fish or poultry. Okay. Cows, pigs have a much bigger environmental impact than chickens do, or fish does. We need to eat less meat overall. Uh, if you, you can do it, go vegetarian. I've tried a couple times and I I can't do full vegetarian. I feel like I have a hard time getting the protein that I need, but I definitely supplement with nuts and beans and things like this. And like I said, my oldest son is, uh, is a vegetarian and we eat very little meat now. And when we do, it's almost always going to be chicken or fish. So what happens if we do eat less meat? Well, since greenhouse gases from livestock are more than the entire global transportation sector, eating less meat would actually make a pretty big impact on the planet. If everyone in the US ate no meat or cheese just one day a week for one year, it would be like not driving 91 billion miles or taking 7.6 million cars off the road. If every student at Willamette did that, no meat, no cheese, one time per week, I'm one, just once for one year, it would be like not driving nearly 360,000 miles or taking 30 cars off the road. Has anyone in their whole life gone a day without meat? Even if it was an accident? Did you survive? <laughs> All right then. Um, I remember getting sick once and I didn't eat anything for a couple of days and I lived and you will too. Um, it's interesting when you start realizing the cattle greenhouse emissions make up 18% of the human impact versus the transportation sector in total, cars, trucks, boats, planes, making up only 13%. And it's not just the greenhouse gases that we need to worry about. But when we start thinking about water impact, which will be in our next unit, water consumption is pretty big when we start thinking about how much meat we consume. In this diagram, you're seeing how much water it takes to produce one pound of meat. So if you're thinking a quarter pounder, right? If you have four hamburgers, how much water does it take to produce that? Four hamburgers. If you're looking at hamburgers, it takes about 1,800 gallons of water to produce four hamburgers for you to consume. Think about that. Versus lamb, about 1,200. Pork, about 700. Chicken, about 500 gallons of water for one pound of meat. Now, conventional water conservation says that if we shorten shower times, turn water off when we're brushing our teeth, etc., you can save two to three gallons of water per day. But if you avoid eating chicken for one day, you're gonna save about 500 gallons of water. Or if you order a veggie burger and no cheese, you just about save 2000 gallons of water. And in places like Southern California, that number is almost doubled because they've had to battle things like drought. So roughly about 56 billion animals worldwide are currently grown for human consumption. They occupy about one fourth of the earth's land and 30% of the earth's arable land is devoted to growing feed for livestock. One third of crops grown all over the planet feed livestock. And global meat production has tripled in the past 30 years and is expected to double by 2050.
that's eight times as much land as we use to grow food for our own consumption. That's crazy when you stop to think about it. And we in the United States, remember, are particularly obsessed with meat. The average American eats close to a pound of meat per day. The projected land requirements to support that much livestock production exceeds 50% more than our current agricultural areas. We literally just don't have the space to do it. So what can we do? Let's start with thinking about trying to just give up one day. Okay, try meatless Mondays. Okay, this is from the University of Washington and it's kind of a big trend that's kind of rising up all over the nation. And, and this is just looking at the environmental impact. There are recent studies out that suggest the consumption of meat, in particular red meat and beef, increases your risk for cancer. So with the potential environmental impact and with the potential for your health impact, it seems to make sense to cut back on the amount of meat we consume. It's the single biggest decision you can make on a daily basis to improve your carbon footprint, to go ahead and lower your impact in terms of climate change. So are you willing to give up meat one day a week? And you might find that if you get good recipes and make good food, you're okay doing it, maybe not just Mondays. Okay? Not saying you need to give up meat or become a vegetarian. I'm just saying, cut back a little bit, consume a little less of it, and the planet might thank you. All right, guys, stay healthy, stay safe. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.